five. Speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared to try to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. Wow. Hello and welcome to World War II. Sorry, the 1940s. It's only been 20 years since World War I and we're back to an era of fighting, fear and questionable fashion choices. America had Rosie the Riveter, we in Britain had Maureen the Munitions Worker or Lilith the Land Girl. There's so much to say about this decade, isn't there? Uh, but I'm going to focus on from a food history point of view and focus on changes within the kitchen. The 1920s and 30s had seen all manner of new exciting things, cocktails, dining out, but with rationing at 1939, that all came abruptly to an end. And it was really the cooks of what 1940, of World War II, that had to get to grips with this new way of life. Petrol had been rationed in 1939, and in January of 1940, butter and sugar were rationed, as well as bacon. Oh, well, that's okay, because I just have a sausage butty instead, followed by all other meat in March. By July of 1940, cooking fat, tea, and cheese were rationed as well. In March 1941, jam, syrup, and treacle were cut. Eggs followed in June, and in November, the distribution of milk was strictly controlled. More was to come. Sweets and chocolate were rationed in 1942. Oh. Oh. And in 1947, the September issue of the Ministry of Food's Food and Nutrition pamphlet included a variety of ways for you to cook whale meat steak. But what was this whale meat loving organisation? Well, the Ministry of Food was originally a government department that was set up in 1916 to ensure that the nation didn't run out of food and to deal with nutrition. And it was shut down and transferred to the Board of Trade in 1921, after the end of World War I, when people thought that needing something to deal with rationing and feeding the nation wouldn't be needed because who would want to start a war after the horrors of World War I? It would be crazy, right? Right? But, as we know, by 1939, the Ministry of Food was back together again, like the shittest superhero nobody wanted. Its goal was simple and honourable, to ensure effective nutrition for the nation. But almost as soon as it was set up, it became immediately apparent that the only way to achieve this was to enforce pretty strict rationing. Britain relied a lot on imported food, and during a global war, getting food into the country could not be guaranteed, so it had to be done here in Britain. We had to make the food that we did have go further. And it worked like this. Everyone was issued with a certain number of points each month which they could tick off in a ration book. A typical adult would be given two ounces, about 56 grams, of butter and cheese a week, plus about 100 grams of bacon or ham and one egg. So if you wanted to blow all of that in one go and make a very tiny quiche, then you could but you would only have two chops or steaks, uh, some cooking fat and a bit of milk left over for the rest of the week. Oh, and a bit of sugar and a little bit of fruit. So, I don't know, you could have some jelly beans to go with your milk steak or, or whatever it was you were cooking. Although I don't think that I would be a sophisticated enough diner for that dinner date. And then that would be it for the rest of the week, apart from some bread and some veg. 
Pregnant women, children and manual labourers got slightly different rations according to their needs, but really frugality was the name of the game for everyone. And along with rationing and food pamphlets, the Ministry of Food was also responsible for encouraging people to grow their own food. The Dig for Victory campaign saw citizens turning their lawns and bits of the side of roads into allotments and veg patches. And by 1943, there was just under 1.5 million allotments in Britain. Additionally, golf courses and sports grounds were also converted into vegetable plots. Everyone was at it. Radio programmes were commissioned to guide clueless novices how to successfully grow their own potatoes and onions. Even the royal family converted some of their massive acreage into veg plots. And the Tower of London changed the purpose of its moat, which was usually filled with lava and crocodiles, into very neat rows of cabbages and onions and carrots. But perhaps no one did more to boost British food production than the Women's Land Army. Initially, it was set up on a volunteer basis, but by 1941, the need for more food production was too great and women could become conscripted into it. And by 1944, there were just over 80,000 Women's Land Army members. Many of them hailed from towns and cities, apparently lured to the countryside by the promise of fresh air and clean living. But they might have been shocked when they arrived to realise that it wasn't just, you know, collecting chicken's eggs and picking sun-ripened strawberries in wicker baskets, and that they would be expected to do things like spread manure and kill and catch rats. Apparently two particular girls were so good at this that they managed to kill 12,000 rats in one year. But it wasn't just food pamphlets and land girls that dominated the home front. The government was also concerned with the lives of ordinary civilians. In 1937, the Mass Observation Project was set up, and this was an organisation that went round collecting normal people's views about everyday life, their concerns, their fears, their hopes, their dreams. When World War II started, Mass Observation Project ramped up its efforts and began asking people to keep war diaries so that they could record what everyday life was like during an actual war. Thousands and thousands of people responded, keeping details that record the absolute minutiae of life and actually show worries that aren't that different from non-wartime concerns. You know, are the neighbours being too nosy? Is my child doing okay at school? These things that seem so insignificant when you consider the wider context of the time period, but show that for a lot of people, living through World War II was something that they had to get on and deal with. They weren't delighted about it. This isn't some kind of lit spirit mythology, but people did have to get on with ordinary life, and the Mass Observation Diaries record that very well. And one thing that the Mass Observation Diaries give us an insight is to how preoccupied people were with food. While I was doing my research, I had access to the diaries, and the food diaries in particular, and Everybody seems to be talking about food in some context. Have we got enough of it? Are we going to run out of this? I don't like eating this. Concerns about, you know, black market food rationing. Everybody is dealing with food rationing. Everybody is dealing with food shortages. And everybody is concerned about how they're going to make it work. So I spent ages looking at the food diaries of Mass Observation Project from World War II. And I stumbled across one in particular that immediately caught my attention. It was written by a woman, we just know that she's called L.C. Taverner, don't know her first name. She's an ex-teacher, she was born in 1887 and she lived in Crouch End, London with her husband and her 10-year-old, then going on to 11-year-old son, in 1940. From the start, her diary was brilliant. It was like hilarious and also really sad in places and just very, very honest. So she was trying to keep really upbeat. Her, the tone of her diary, she writes absolutely loads. And I knew she would because she's an ex-teacher. Um, she writes so much detail, really, really like concerned. Am I writing the right things? This is, this is what I did. Here's the time that I woke up. Here's where I went, you know, basically the only thing she's not recording is when she's going to the toilet. Um, and she says on like page three or four of her diary, you know, oh, you're going to have to ration paper soon if everyone's writing as much as I am. So she's quite like jolly to read and clearly enjoys writing. So she was, a, she was a fantastic read. She was really engaging, really funny and really, really touching. And uh, yeah, just brilliant, just brilliant to read. But the thing that was most useful to me for this was that on the 19th of February 1940, she records in very, very accurate detail 
exactly what she ate in the day. Starting with breakfast, working her way through snacks, lunch, and then dinner time, and then supper as well for her husband and son. So I have gone to Ministry of Food food pamphlets from World War II, and I've found recipes for all of the things that Miss Tavener ate on the 19th of February, 1940, and I'm gonna try and recreate them today. Hope you enjoy. To make beef curried with boiled potatoes, you will need 450 grams of beef, 425 mils of water, four tablespoons of flour, one teaspoon of sugar, one medium cooking apple, one small onion, two potatoes, one tablespoon of orange marmalade, one teaspoon of black treacle, one and a half tablespoons of curry powder, two teaspoons of salt, half a teaspoon of dried mustard powder, one tablespoon of chutney, 42 grams of beef dripping. Slice the onion and apple and fry in the dripping for about 10 minutes until soft. Add the beef which has been cut into cubes and fry until brown. Remove the beef and add the mustard, curry powder, flour and water. Stir constantly until thickened. Add the sugar and treacle and chutney and marmalade and apologise to everyone who actually enjoys curries. Add the salt and the beef and leave it to cook on a very low heat for about one to one and a half hours. So while the curry cooks, one thing that Miss Tavener did at 11.45 just before lunch was ready was to make her and her husband a cup of coffee every day and have it with a biscuit. Now coffee was never um, officially rationed but it just became very very hard to get hold of. So I'm going to use bog standard instant coffee rather than fancy fancy ground coffee and I'm going to have my coffee with Anzac biscuits. To make Anzac biscuits you will need 85 grams of margarine, 85 grams of sugar, half a teaspoon of vanilla essence, 225 grams of rolled oats, 85 grams of plain flour, one tablespoon of golden syrup, one teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda, two tablespoons of hot water. Cream the margarine and sugar together. Add the syrup. Dissolve the bicarb in hot water and add to the margarine mixture. Sift the flour into the mixture and fold in the oats. Place teaspoon sized portions onto a baking tray. You might find it helpful to then push them down so that they become a bit flatter. Bake at 180 degrees for about 15 to 20 minutes. I don't normally drink coffee and I certainly don't drink it black, but there's a war on. We're rationed, so needs must. And here is my Anzac biscuit. These were popular. I think these uh, were invented sort of during World War One because of obviously Anzac. Um, and I think that you can still get them today, but they've got coconut in them and these ones don't. They also seem a little bit more rock bun shaped than perhaps I would expect for a biscuit. So maybe you're supposed to squidge them down a little bit. But the recipe said just put into teaspoon shapes. So that's what I've done. Let's see. Uh. Uh, no. This is nice. It's kind of like a less sweet flapjack and it's got flour in it, so obviously it's more biscuity than a flapjack. But as a sort of midday pre-lunch coffee and biscuits, very, very pleasant. I'd make these again. About 30 minutes before you're ready to serve, slice the potatoes in half and boil them in water for 25 minutes or until soft. Okay, so beef curry. I really like curry with boiled potatoes. Mm. I love curry and this is not a curry as far as I'm concerned. I've sprinkled on some um, Parsley because I wanted to. What was it called? I can't remember if it's called under parsley. Uh, because I wanted, I wanted to break up the yellowy brownness of it all. But if anything, I think it just emphasises the the lack of kind of colour in this. Um, I don't know why it's got marmalade and treacle in it. 
and chutney. I think that what's happened here is that the Ministry of Food has put so many recipes for stew into their pamphlets, because that's really all you can do, um, that they've gone, right, we can't have another recipe of stew. We'll call it curry and we'll stick a tablespoon of curry powder in and then that will be a curry. And I'm not quite sure that a tablespoon of curry powder does a curry make. So we'll see what this tastes like. Mm -mm. <laughs> that is very odd. It's quite bitter. I wonder if that's because of the marmalade. Maybe the marmalade is probably the strongest flavour. I don't know. It's quite bitter and sweet at the same time. It's not spicy. It's not spicy at all. But it's... Uh, it's very odd, I, I honestly can't describe it. It is exactly what you would imagine if you mixed chutney and marmalade and treacle and sugar in a pan with water and meat and apple. And like, that's it, I'm just describing the ingredients. That's really helpful, Ellie, well done. Um, but seriously, I cannot describe it. It's very odd. And I don't think that I would look forward to that if I was Kenneth coming home from school and my mum had made me be this beef curry, Mrs Tavern has made Kenneth beef curry. I don't think that I would be delighted to get home from double maths and then have that. So, mm, I understand why it's made, it uses up a lot of ingredients, potatoes were never rationed, so, you know, you've got potatoes as the boiled potato accompaniment there, you can have as many of them really as you, as you can get your hands on. Um, I understand that it uses up ingredients, I understand that it's going to be an exciting twist on, like I said, stews that you're going to be used to, but it's a twist that should not have been allowed to see the light of day, in my opinion. Mm, not good. Very, very odd. Anyway, hopefully the dessert that she served after this is a little bit more palatable. To make scrap bread pudding, you will need a handful of currants, 115 grams of stale bread, four teaspoons of sugar, half a pint of custard using bird's custard powder mixed up with a quarter pint of milk and a quarter pint of water. Grease a heat proof bowl. Soak the bread in the water and squeeze it out before putting it into the bowl. Mix up the bird's custard powder using the instructions on the side of the packet but use half milk and half water instead of full milk. Pour the custard over the bread. Scatter the currants on top and bake at 180 degrees C for about 30 minutes. Okay, scrap bread pudding. It looks um, quite appetising. It looks like a sort of, um, you know, poor man's bread and butter custardy pudding. So there's nothing in here that makes me uh, too nervous, other than the fact that the custard was obviously made with half milk, half water, so it might not be super, super flavoursome. But we'll see. It's not very sweet. It's not unpleasant, actually. It's, it does just taste like a kind of quite bland bread and butter pudding. Um, the currants, a quite a nice addition because they give it a bit of a fruitiness but the, because you're just scattering them on top that doesn't go down all the way through so I can imagine that they're probably the best bit and I can imagine I can imagine like Kenneth picking them off to be honest when she's not looking and then that's all the currants gone they're not scattered throughout the dish so again you can see these kind of wartime cheats it's about the presentation maybe and then the actual tasting of it is a little bit underwhelming but because it looks good it tricks your eyes it tricks your stomach it tricks your taste buds by the time you've eaten it all you kind of realize that wasn't brilliant you've already eaten it and you're full and you're satisfied so yeah I would eat that it might be nice with extra custard poured over it I think would work quite nicely is it as good as a bread and butter pudding today obviously not no for supper Mrs Tavener ate homemade bread and sardines I'm not going to show you how to make that because it's just fish and bread but I will show you how to make the jam tarts that she had after to make ministry of food wartime jam you will need 600 grams of strawberries, 190 grams of sugar, juice of half a lemon, 190 grams of honey. Hull the strawberries, 
and place them in a pan with the lemon juice and heat until very soft. Mix the sugar and the honey and add to the melted strawberries. Cook until it has reached 105 degrees C, that's the setting point for jam. If your jam doesn't set, you may need to add more lemon juice or try cooking it with sugar enriched with pectin. Pour into sterilised jam jars. Cover with greaseproof paper discs. To make jam tarts, you will need 12 teaspoons or so of jam, 225 grams of plain flour, 70 grams of lard, half a teaspoon of salt, cold water. Rub flour and salt and lard together until it is the consistency of sand and breadcrumbs. Add enough water to form a dough. Roll out no thicker than half a centimetre and cut into circles. Grease a tart pan with lard and place dough circles into each well. Add a teaspoon of jam to each tart. Bake at about 200 degrees for 20 minutes. Okay, and then we come to the cake bit of supper. And this is what I'm really looking forward to. Now in the Ministry of Food, it says, don't overfill your tarts because obviously the jam will then come out and that's a waste and blah, blah, blah. And clearly I've not listened because my jam has come all the way out of this tart. But I am really excited about this. The pastry, I'm expecting to be really good. I've used lard in here and that makes a really short, short crust pastry. So. <gasps> that is good, especially with like a cup of tea. Even though Miss Tavener complains about running out of food, what's the boy gonna eat? Um, she complains slightly about uninspiring meals. Actually, okay, yes, the meat curry, not, <laughs> not fantastic. The pudding, pretty bland, you know, edible, filling, but still quite bland. The supper, really pleasant, very simple, very, very cost effective, but those jam tarts absolutely stand out for me. So, even if she's not had the best day in terms of the food that she's eaten on the 19th of February, I'm sure that she went to bed. Oh, I've got more pastry here. Um, I'm sure that she went to bed really, really happy if the jam tart was the last thing that she ate. So hopefully you've enjoyed this episode of the 1940s. Um, I wanted to show just a bit of a different side, really, to rationing, because I think food in the 1940s gets a super bad press. And that's because it, you know, it's not particularly delightful food anyway. And because people aren't able to buy uh, ingredients that they would normally want to cook with. We see things like Wal Lord Walton's pie. We've seen mock cream. You know, we've seen these um, really bland, insipid recipes that people just don't want to eat now. Things like spam and whatever. Um, but actually, ordinary people are really, really inventive and they are really good at making the best of what they've got and they're really good at putting positive spin on it. So I didn't just want to make crap basically and then sit here and go, oh, well, that's disgusting, that's disgusting, uh, 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 because well, that's not really fun for you and it's definitely not fun for me. And it's also not truly representative. Sure, people are eating things that they don't like. Yes, was the beef curry something I'll be making again? Absolutely fucking not. But it's actually showing that they are trying very, very hard. And things like that jam tart, I would not know was a wartime recipe. The, the, the sardines and bread, okay, if you served it to me for, for dinner, I might be a bit like, oh, this is quite old fashioned and it's not something that I'm used to, but it tastes absolutely fine. That bread and butter pudding, yes, quite bland. I would probably judge your cooking skills if you serve that to me and be like, but if you served it with custard and maybe added a bit more sugar, would I know that it's different from any other kind of bread and butter pudding? Probably not either. So do you know what? It's not the dreadful, bleak, 
horrible situation that it's always made out to be. People like Mrs Taverner are making the most of what they've got, they are feeding their family, they are surviving this war, and they're surviving it in relative style. Obviously not everybody, there are still the class strata, there's still people in society who are struggling, we still have the black market, but I hope that what you've seen today is a snapshot of really one family in London in the 1940s getting on with it and actually making some, some pretty decent food when it comes down to it. Thank you so much and I hope you join me for the next time when I'm cooking the 1950s on The Past is a Foreign Pantry. Guess we'll just stop then.